Welcome, everybody. We're so happy to have you joining us in Zoom this uh, lovely summer morning. Um, just before we get started, um, a few notes about how to participate in today's program. Um, we're using the webinar format, which some of you may have encountered before, but this will mean that your videos and microphones are turned off um, during the presentation. Um, but you are very welcome to enter your questions in the Q&A box um, throughout the program, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will leave the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So you can put them in the box throughout, um, but we will get to them um, after we hear from Michael and Rachel. Um, we are planning for about a half hour presentation this morning. Um, so we should wrap up just around 11.30. And we're super excited to have so many of you joining us. It looks like we have um, about 265 and counting um, folks joining us in Zoom. So what a wonderful thing um, to be able to be together today. Um, so today's program is the second installment in a series we're calling Painting Edo at the Arnold Arboretum. Um, and it is a collaboration between the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University and the Harvard Art Museums. Um, inspired by our recent exhibition, um, Painting Edo, um, which features really remarkable um, works of art um, and incredible botanical scenes. Um, and we've had the opportunity to work together with the Arboretum to apply um, some of the lo close looking that's possible at the works of art um, to the collections at the Arboretum and, and really marvel at um, the accuracy with which these artists are rendering um, these nat the natural world and these botanical subjects. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Pam to introduce our speakers for today. Okay, thank you, Molly. Um, if you don't know Molly Ryan, she is the program manager for the Harvard Art Museums, and I am the uh, manager of adult education for the Arnold Arboretum. And very quickly, the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University is a 281-acre public park and research collection of woody trees, shrubs, and vines located in Boston, Massachusetts. Our landscape is open 365 days of the year from dawn until dusk, and it's free to all. And right now, we just ask that you practice social distancing and wear a mask when you visit. Um, our speakers today are Rachel Saunders and Michael Dosman. Rachel Saunders is the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Curator of Asian Art at the Harvard Art Museums, where she's responsible for the Japanese collections. Rachel is a specialist in medieval narrative and sacred painting, and she's recently curated the exhibition Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection. This is the uh, exhibit that we are working from today for this program. Michael Dosman is the keeper of the living collections with the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University. As keeper of the living collections, Michael advocates for and curates one of the finest collections of temperate woody plants on earth, comprising some 16 to 17,000 accessioned plants. That number keeps increasing, so um, we'll say 17,000 for now. And I think that's all I need to say for this. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A and let's begin with Rachel Saunders. Thank you, Pam, and thank you everybody for joining us this morning. It's wonderful to be together in the Zoomverse this morning. Uh, uh, we are, as Molly and Pam said, working from the exhibition Painting Edo, uh, which is the uh, special exhibition uh, that is at the Harvard Art Museums. It's opened on, uh, February 14th, 2020. And here's a shot from that opening evening when we were all together in a different way. Uh, we had to close about a month later due to the pandemic. So uh, the exhibition is currently dark, but you can access it uh, digitally. It's got a few digital avatars now. Uh, you can get to it from our museum's web page. Uh, you can experience a digital online exhibition through Google here. And we've been doing a number of video uh, and other types of programming, which you can find on our Vimeo page, including the video of our last uh, collaboration with the Arnold Arboretum, which was on magnolias. And I think uh, perhaps in the chat box, they'll be appearing the, the web link for you to explore if you would like. Uh, the magnolia uh, session like this one was recorded. So uh, it is now available as a video as we hope this one will be too. 
so painting Edo, uh, I'm not going to spend too long on this because today we're going to talk about plants and we're going to talk about seeing and looking. But if we were in the galleries together, this would be what you would see as you enter the exhibition. It's an exhibition that features more than 120 works of art from the collection of Robert and Betsy Feinberg, who've been collecting Japanese art for almost half a century now. And they have, in an incredible act of generosity, promised their collection of more than 300 paintings uh, to the Harvard Art Museums. And this exhibition marks that promise, uh, showing that it's the largest exhibition we've ever organized in the history of the museums. And it, it does tell a story of early modern Japanese painting. So painting from the Edo period, which is 1615 to 1868. And we did that in sort of two, uh, 10 slightly revisionist chapters here. So you, you can get that story from the exhibition. But more importantly, it was a show that attempted to offer the opportunity to see differently through paintings that both reflected and constructed a very different time and place, but which is still accessible to us in uh, 21st century Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, and now in the Zoomverse, uh, very much further afield. Uh, but today's talk is really about uh, hydrangeas, or ajisai in Japanese, and it's about how encountering this plant from two different modes of seeing, from the eyes of an art historian, um, that would be me, and the eyes of a, a botanist, that would be Michael, and how looking together from two different angles can really change the way that you can see um, and help you even see things you, you didn't know you were looking for. Uh, this has been my, my takeaway from it together. So Michael, do you wanna just start, uh, talk about how this all got going? Right, well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Probably about six or seven months ago, uh, Rachel and Molly and a few of their colleagues came over to the Arboretum and visited with Pam and, and uh, Professor Ned Friedman, our director, and a few other staff. And we started to talk about the about the uh, forthcoming exhibit, thinking about some ways that we could we could collaborate. And um, one of those was a joint uh, lecture, uh, a member between our membership and supporters uh, for both the Harvard Art Museums and the Arnold Arboretum, uh, a lecture held at the end of February uh, after the show opened at the, um, at the uh, art museums and in the galleries. Prior to that, after it opened, I, uh, I perused the collection uh, a little bit on my own stealthily, and then about an hour and a half later, uh, met up with Rachel. And, and I was ecstatic, bouncing up and down um, uh, with things that I had seen. I'd gone through the catalog online and, and print before, but as we know with these beautiful art pieces and any objects, uh, you know, seeing, seeing the object in, in, its, you know, in real time uh, is, is really something that uh, you know, a digital or a paper uh, replica doesn't take the place of. And one of the things that I was, I, I think as soon as, you know, Rachel came out into the, into the atrium area and I, I basically grabbed her by the arm and I said, we got, <laughs> let, I have to go over here and, and, and show you these things. Um, and we came right over here to these screens and I was, I was gobsmacked in just the level of botanical detail uh, that I didn't expect to see. Uh, and, and looking at these screens, which are quite large. Uh, Rachel, how large, what's, what's the rough dimensions of these again? So each screen is about three and a half meters uh, in, in width. So it's, it's almost seven meters. They're very large uh, and about 165 centimeters high. So about five foot five high. Right. And so you know, the, the scale is, is amazing. You can just like walk right into, into the screens. And uh, you know, we were, we were going through this, these two screens together. And I was like, wow, this is, yeah, I could recognize all of these different species. You could use these screens to teach a class on plant families of the world or, you know, learn certain genera, both from a botanical and then also a horticultural perspective. Uh, and so this is kind of where I think we're going to take a little deeper dive now. What's the, what's the kind of the history of these? Uh, what period did these date from again, Rachel? So these are, we believe these are late 17th century screens. Um, and shall I move on to the next slide? We yeah, have a, yeah. yeah some information printed there. Yeah, yeah. So, there, so here we have the, the, the tombstone as we call it in the, uh, in the museum world. Um, these are a pair of se late 17th century screens by the so-called Sotatsu school um, and they're flowering plants of the four seasons. So this is a type of screen that really became popular late 17th, 18th century. And uh, they came out of a sort of collision of interest in Kyoto, in the old imperial capital of Kyoto, around the emperor's circle in both imported Chinese and Korean paintings of grasses and flowers and insects and birds. And I'm using these words, uh, these are words we use all the time, but bird and flower painting and grasses and insects painting are actually two 
official genres of painting in East Asia. So they have an, a, a, a proper meaning as well. So there were these paintings being imported of plants and flowers, but also there was a really, uh, there was a rise in interest in gardening and horticulture and um, kind of boom in gardening, in fact. And there were even celebrity gardeners, as we would call them today. Uh, and we have the diary of one of these 17th century celebrity gardeners that still survives in which he talks about how he collected plants, he swapped plants, he grew plants, he grafted plants, gifted plants, he received plants. And many of these plants are the plants that we find in this type of screen painting right here. And so if we start at the far right hand side of the right hand screen, we're actually in spring. And um, in the Zoomverse, I've covered spring with Michael's face. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Here's spring. Um, so, uh, so we start in spring, and there's kind of a notional pathway through these plants here. You can see, I hope you can see my arrow is sort of moving through the pathway. Going through the season, spring to summer, and then jumping summer to fall, and fall into kind of winter. Yeah, there's a little tiny bit of winter right at the end of the, uh, the uh, end of the left hand screen here. So we're moving right to left as you would in East Asia. And uh, I'm not really the person to be doing the plant identification here, but this one I know. So um, we start off spring with carrier roses and we move into peonies. Right. Uh, and then we get into the sort of summer area here. And there's a lot of water plants come crop up in summer right out of the bottom of the screen as if they're rising out of a pond that you can't quite see. One of the things when Rachel and I were, were looking at this, and uh, I mean, it very much does look like a, a, a garden landscape, you know, somebody is, who, who had designed a landscape out in, you know, outdoors and were able to bring it in. And, and again, uh, recognizing that water garden, if you will, in the foreground, uh, it, it, it conjures up a, a amazing imagery. Certainly does, yeah. Um, and especially when we come back to this part, but uh, we'll move on, we'll go into the full screen here. So we got bush clover here, which is, um, those of you who are familiar with Japanese poetry, this is, you know, it's an iconic plant in autumn poetry. And we move on through here, I think this is Fuyo, some kind of autumn hibiscus maybe. And then this wonderful stand of uh, chrysanthemums for autumn. It sort of balances out the peonies in the right hand screen for spring. And then we finish up the year with this kind of Nandina and um, Suisa and uh, Narcissus plant at the bottom and a little bit of um, bamboo here. So we're sort of getting a cycle, the all four seasons in one. So uh, in a way, you might have had uh, someone doing your garden for you in Kyoto in the 17th, 18th century, and you, and you might have been procuring all kinds of plants and maintenance and all that kind of thing. But another thing you could have done was to commission a pair of screens like this so you could have a permanent virtual garden inside whenever you, whenever you desired. So let's go to the let's let's go to the the right hand screen. I think we have a, a a blow up of it, and there you can you can certainly see as Rachel was describing that moving from from spring to summer, right to left, from the Caria japonica, the peonies, uh, and then towards the you know there's a clematis climbing up into some bamboo, uh, and uh, in that area, if you go to the next screen, uh, Rachel, or the next slide, you know one of the things just jumping out, and I mentioned earlier about um, you know some of the botanical detail, you'll notice that these are some uh, pinks, some, some species of dianthus, probably dianthus japonica, so relative to the carnation. And it's in the Caryophyllaceae or family. And, and what, are the, what are the just quick botanical traits, not just that they have pinked petals that look like, not pink the color, but pinking with shears, uh, notched petals, but even where the leaves tie in together, the nodes are a little swollen. And I think uh, in the Zoomiverse, uh, Zoomiverse, I think Rachel could even point that out as a, uh, she's, she's driving today, uh, but you can see where um, there's slightly swollen nodes uh, where those two leaves tie together. And again, these are just wonderful family traits or characteristics that describe that plant family, uh, Caryophyllaceae. And so these are just some of the great details. But we're not here to talk about Caryophyllaceae or Dianthus. We're here to talk about hydrangeas. Uh, so I think um, let's let's go to the next screen. I think uh, oh, yeah, so yeah, so. on that on that far left hand side, kind of at the edge of summer um, uh, in that fifth or sixth month uh, we have some hydrangeas that I, I looked at and and this is a height of hydrangea season I think definitely here in New England uh, and uh, you can see the the bluish bl green leaves and uh, both the upper and the lower sides of the leaves are kind of different hues uh, and then you can also see those inflorescences or clusters of flowers um, and uh, a little bit about hydrangea I think if if um, we'll go back to this image a little later, but if you go to the next slide, Rachel, um, you know, 
Uh, oh, sorry. Go back. I no, forgot the 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 the. Uh, you want to mention a little bit about hydrangeas in uh, in in Japanese culture. Uh, sure. Just just very quickly, just to interject very quickly. I guess um, when I was looking at this uh, this image here, I mean, I recognized it as a hydrangea, but um, for me, sort of coming at it from a art historical point of view or Japanese um, cultural point of view, I was thinking about hydrangeas really being associated with the fifth month, uh, fifth month of the lunar year, that is, so about June, July in our money. Um, and that it's really kind of minor player in both painting and poetry um, until the Edo period, until the early, early um, modern era when it starts to make a, make a, a reappearance perhaps um, because it becomes a poetic season word in the new fashionable type of poetry, which is haiku poetry. So it becomes a, a, an official season word for the fifth month and people use it for fifth month poems. Um, but just looking a little bit further back, in fact, it does have quite a long history in Japanese poetry. It appears in um, the Man Yoshu, the ninth, uh, eighth century first anthology. So long history of people appreciating it um, at a certain level. And um, the, when, when it appears in the uh, early text, it's written with these characters here, which are uh, sort of ateji. They, they, they don't actually um, connect necessarily with a the meaning. They're used for their sound. So we have four characters there, aji, sai. Um, but these days is written with these characters here. And um, I discovered that, that uh, it may be a sort of contraction of aji from the verb atsu to gather with sai, which is a contraction from shin ai, or true blue, um, which I thought was really interesting because it's celebrating the blue, whereas where I grew up, hydrangeas were always pink. We just couldn't have a blue hydrangea, so. <laughs> um, but anyway, Michael is going to give us a little more about real hydrangeas. I mean, hydrangeas are, uh, thank you, Rachel, hydrangeas are, are one, of the, uh, one of the genera uh, that are very popular in, in gardens. Uh, you know, the, uh, the genus comprises roughly about 70, 75 different species in the Americas and Western Hemisphere and then Asia, East Asia in particular. And um, the, the greatest amount of diversity there is, is in East Asia, uh, particularly Japan and China. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we have these garden nest plants where there's a climbing hydrangea, like we can see hydrangea anomala, uh, petiolaris uh, in full white uh, splendor uh, atop a wall. And then you can also see even like one of our North American native species, uh, the smooth hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence. And there are many cultivated varieties or cultivars uh, of that um, in our gardens, including one uh, that uh, is called Annabelle. Uh, but if you go to the next slide, Rachel, um, when I looked at the, the screen and we saw that, that image, and here we have an inset, uh, we can see, you can see the blue green leaves. Um, and that, I said instantly, it's like, wow, this is hydrangea macrophylla, uh, big leaf hydrangea. And looking at that, and then the photograph is of a hydrangea macrophylla, big leaf hydrangea, one of our accessions at the Arnold Arboretum, uh, growing in the Levin Shrub and Vine Garden. And you can see the striking resemblance. Uh, what's interesting, and I'll go over a little bit of what we're looking at, but is that the, uh, the plant in question that we're actually looking at, the, the, the living plant, was actually collected in the wild in Ch uh, Chiba Prefecture uh, and, and given uh, by some collectors from, uh, from uh, Chiba University. They collected seed and supplied it to the Arboretum in 2007. And so what you're seeing uh, is what a hydrangea macrophylla growing in the wilds of Japan would have looked like. And a little bit about the, the morphology of, of hydrangeas is you will have these clusters of flowers uh, and inflorescence, typically with a, a perimeter of large showy flowers that comprise very showy sepals. So they're petaloid sepals. Uh, sepal is just a part of the flower. And, and Rachel, if you could use the pointer and just so people oops, can see that, you can see that ray basically. And this we call a, a lace cap. Uh, is, is often a, a term that will be used. So you have those, the perimeter of the um, often but not exclusively sterile flowers with these large showy petaloid sepals that attract pollinators. And then in the middle, you'll see uh, a, a, a number of uh, smaller flowers that are the fertile flowers. These are the ones that are going to get pollinated and you know, post-fertilization will, will supply the, the seeds that'll set, uh, you know, set the next generation uh, on its way. And you can see the striking resemblance. So here we have in the, in the screen, you'll see what looks to me as a, as a relatively right, direct from nature, uh, hydrangea macrophylla. Uh, and so that was, a, that was a wonderful thing to say. It's a wow, the great, great detail. 
uh, I think uh, the next image. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to show this um, because uh, this is another hydrangea that's in bloom. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a little, doesn't look this good right now after all of Boston's heat. This is about three weeks ago at the Arnold Arboretum. This is actually a cultivar, a cultivated variety called Tokyo Delight. And uh, this was one that was, um, you can see those beautiful, uh, uh, a, a nice lace cap flower. You can see that perimeter of showy uh, flowers that have those petaloid sepals, the large, what look like petals. But if you look, um, oftentimes people will say these are always sterile, but if you look at this, uh, you can see the functional parts in the middle of those. You can see the stamens and, uh, you know, so they're at least bearing pollen. Uh, and then you can see the, what people would call the fertile flowers in the middle. What I love about this cultivar is that it actually arose at the University of Tokyo Botanic Garden. One of our past uh, taxonomists, uh, Shui Ying Hu, uh, had spent uh, part of 1968, 1969 uh, back in Hong Kong and then a little bit of doing research uh, and then also a little bit of time in, uh, in Korea and in Japan. And she was doing some work in that garden and visiting with colleagues at the University of Tokyo. And she was blown away by a particular plant that she had seen. And she quoted, she, uh, she said, she had never seen, she goes, and when she wrote about this, she says, I have not seen such a beautiful hydrangea anywhere. And she'd seen hydrangeas all over the place uh, in, in Japan, but also in China where, you know, she, she was born. And so she had never seen one that was that spectacular. And so they, uh, they gave her permission to collect cuttings. She took cuttings, shipped them back to the Arnold Arboretum and uh, to the propagator at the time, Al Fordham, and he propagated it. And uh, she was so delighted by this cultivar, uh, cultivated variety of this clone that she gave it the uh, kind of non-Latinized or the fancy name of Tokyo Delight. Uh, so I, if you want to step through a couple more images, Rachel, we have just, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful cascade of, 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 of inflorescences and, and stepping back one more, uh, you can see uh, in dappled shade underneath our Acer collection, our maple collection, you can see this, this beautiful array of, of, uh, of lace caps. What was even more interesting, if you go one more slide, uh, last May I was in Japan uh, on an expedition and at the conclusion I was, uh, found myself in, in Tokyo and finally got a chance to visit the University of Tokyo Botanic Garden and saw uh, some hydrangea macrophylla uh, in cultivation, slightly different uh, than Tokyo Delight, but uh, certainly inspired. Uh, they both inspire each other. And so I thought that was um, uh, uh, just a, a wonderful little aha to see that. And here again, you can see the, you know, the shrubs and all those inflorescences or clusters of flowers, individual flowers. Uh, and, uh, and, and Rachel, what, is there anything I, you know, uh, my, my ability to speak Japanese is pretty non-existent. So uh, what is the interpretive signage or the accession sign on that uh, read? Uh, it looks like it's indicating um, maybe the place of origin. Uh, it's, it's the name, it's given uh, Gaku Ajisai, which is a little different than Hydrangea Microfiller. Maybe, maybe this is the way we would think about it in Japanese. Um, and then it's, it's, underneath looks like it says where it may have come from, which looks like it was the Izu, um, Izu area of Japan. Um, so. There is, for people, Hydrangea aficionados, there's Hydrangea Macrophylla, there's another related species called Hydrangea Serrata, they may or may not be one above the other, but they have hybridized as well. And so uh, you might see them both as hydrangea macrophylla, hydrangea macrophylla subspecies serrata, or hydrangea serrata, or hybrids between them. And uh, scientists are still working that uh, family tree out, if you will. <laughs> anyway, you want to go on to the next image? Sure. Um, All right. Yeah. So we finally tore ourselves away from these screens, which, you know, I thought I've been looking at them pretty closely because, uh, you know, even though they're not sort of photorealistically painted, I've been identifying the plants from what was there and we had more than 50 on a list already. So I, I thought I'd seen something, <laughs> but Michael showed me something else. So we finally tore, tore ourselves away from that screen. On the way out of the exhibition, um, we stopped at this cycle of paintings here, which, um, if, uh, if you have uh, seen the exhibition or if you've seen the exhibition catalog, you'll know I was particularly interested in, um, so I wrote my catalog essay on this set. And it's a wonderful set of 12 paintings 
by the painter Sakai Hoitsu, 12 paintings of the birds and flowers of the 12 months, which is a very old painting subject, an uh, old poetic subject in uh, Jap uh, Japanese cultural history. But um, this is a new vocabulary. Uh, Sakai Hoitsu introduced a whole bunch of new plants and animals into this very old, this classical model. And so I was very interested in that and thinking about where these new plants and flowers had come from, and they mostly had come from the new and very fashionable haiku or haikai a poetic culture that grew up in, in the Edo period. And we stopped, as you might guess, right here. Uh, this is actually the fifth month because we're moving from the right to the left again. So this is the fifth month. Um, and we, of course, stopped there because there were more hydrangeas. And um, I had thought about these hydrangeas more from a sort of symbolic point of view. As you can see in this painting, they're paired with some hollyhocks right here. And then these beautiful sort of blue um, sort of, um, morphing to white uh, large flower heads here, which I had just you know, sort of given over as hydrangeas. You know. I thought I'd done a good job by figuring that part out. Um, and the reason I was interested in them uh, for Sakai Hoitsu was that I have interpreted these paintings as a kind of floral offering for, for the souls of his um, departed family. And um, art historians among you may know that uh, Sakai Hoitsu took as his nominal painting master a man named Ogata Kodin, um, whose name is, is down here. A uh, man he never met, but he, he followed in his footsteps as he could. And he mounted a very important centenary uh, exhibition and uh, celebration for Corin's life in 1716. And one of the things that he painted for this was this painting I'm showing you here, which is uh, uh, it's an offering to Kanon, this deity here. And it's a Buddhist floral offering for the repose of the soul of Orgata Kordin, and it's inscribed on this, this vase that the flowers are in here. And as you can see, we've got hydrangeas and we've got hollyhocks. We also have here some lilies and some more pinks, in fact. And he painted this combination of flowers over and over again as a kind of tribute um, to his master for, and it's, it's really like offering, say, incense or uh, funeral services or flowers for the repose of a soul in the Buddhist context. So I was thinking about these flowers in that kind of context. Um, but of course, Michael saw something else. Um, yeah, when, when I saw that, so, you know, there's about a, a hundred, 150 year difference, roughly, is that correct, yeah. uh, between the, the screens that we had seen before and then these scrolls. And when I noticed this, uh, you know, with the fifth month's depiction with the, uh, um, the hollyhocks and then what we would call, instead of the lace caps, which I was showing you before, now we have a classic mop head, just a kind of a colloquial term for these hortensias, another common name for hydrangea. And, and absolutely, we're seeing uh, uh, a different type or form of the hydrangea macrophyllar, the big leaf, uh, these mop heads. So and remember, you know, what I did, was describing and, and Rachel was, was pointing with the arrows, we had, you know, in those lace caps, you have the, 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 the fertile flowers in the middle and then the quote unquote sterile ones with the large petaloid sepals on the outside. Well, through uh, selection uh, by able gardeners who witness things that they like to see. Uh, there wasn't any class, uh, plant breeding per se, but people would select things that were showy and interesting. And over time, you can have directed selection uh, where uh, all of a sudden we have uh, hydrangeas that have they become fewer and fewer mop uh, lace caps and more and more of the mop heads. And so what you're seeing is a greater number of those quote unquote sterile that very showy large sepals uh, and uh, on the inflorescence of the flower cluster. And so in that image on the right, you can see a classic uh, mop head with predominantly just this, what we would call the sterile um, flowers with maybe a few, and you can see kind of those dark dots, the kind of the bluish purple dots in the middle that might be the artist's depiction of some of the uh, fertile flowers, the ones that will produce the seeds, but the, the rest of them are ones that are not necessarily for the benefit of the plant from an evolutionary perspective, but for the benefit of the gardener. And this is something that uh, to me is like, wow, you know, not saying that they didn't have these mop heads in the, in the 17th, early 18th century, uh, but uh, we're, you know, it's an indication to me kind of historical uh, horticulture of when did some of these cultivars, cultivated varieties or mutants, if you will, start to show up in the ornamental gardening scene. Uh, we definitely know that they were present 
uh, when that scroll is painted. And just to show you what they look like in real life, this is one of those many cultivars. There's, yeah, you drive down to the Cape, go uh, pretty much around the world and you'll see the, the mop heads or even in forests, you'll see uh, the potted plant, um, these macrophyllas, generally macrophyllas. And this, this cultivar here is one, this is not at the Arnold Arboretum, this is another botanical garden, but this is uh, called Merit's Beauty. And, and this is not necessarily, uh, uh, this is from the early part of the 1900s, the 19 teens, 1920s from a plant breeder in, in Louisiana, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Joseph Merritt. And he had selected and introduced a, a slew of different cultivars, one which was named after him after the fact. Uh, and it's just one among many. And uh, I know the question always comes up and Rachel alluded to it earlier where she grew up in the UK, uh, their soils uh, tend to be very chalky. Uh, and what that means is that the soil pH tends not to have very much acid in it. It tends to be very alkaline, and so it has a high soil pH. Uh, not all hydrangeas have the capacity to, to change the color of their flowers, but many do, or not many, but some do, and including in particular the hydrangea macrophylla. So when you're in high soil pH, you tend to have more of the pinks uh, expressed, the pink pigments expressed in the uh, in the, the, the sepals and the flowers. Uh, and as your soil drops in pH, as it gets more acidic, uh, as there's a chemical reaction with aluminum, uh, and uh, you tend to then have greater expression of the deeper reds to purples to blues if you've got really good soil pH. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, Japan, there tend to be a lot of organic matter, a lot of lower pH soils. And so uh, it's not unusual to see a preponderance of the blue. And so even thinking about from the, the translation of, uh, of what hydrangea might mean is that, yeah, these, these plants, the hydrangea serratas and the hydrangea macrophyllas in their native Japan tend to be surrounded and growing in the wild or in people's gardens in low soil pH. And so they tend to be blue. It's only when we, we, we pluck them out of nature and we grow them maybe in, maybe in chalky soil and in, in, uh, in, in the UK or maybe in other parts of the US uh, when we start to get the, the pinkish colors expressed. I'm just noticing this might be complete coincidence, but it looks like maybe some pinks down here. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually those are some lichnus. You're right. Those are uh, lichnus coronaria or silene. Sorry, they changed the genus name, but yeah, Caryophyllaceae. Exactly. So that's, that's, that's spontaneous. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and so here's just at the, at the kind of this composite image again, showing uh, the top two images of kind of the, the lace cap of hydrangeas. Uh, and then the bottom two images of what we would refer to as the mop heads, uh, both the uh, life imitating art or art imitating life. Um, it's been really fantastic. And that, you know, thinking about this, you know, Rachel and I don't think we met before December, or maybe it was November of last year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I love about this show is that um, it's brought a couple of curators together uh, to really uh, uh, learn so much about each other's practice, but then to be reciprocally inspired by each the, the objects that each of us uh, curates. And that, that reciprocal illumination is, is just spectacular. And I think some synergy that um, uh, I'm really thrilled with. And, and it's, it's just fantastic to see this uh, and, and many, many future collaborations, not just between the two of us, uh, but between our, our two host uh, home institutions. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's one of the, the marvelous things about uh, working on a campus where there's so many people with different types of expertise that can really help you see differently, even if you think your job every day is, is looking. Um, there's always more to see in a different way. Thank you. All right. Um, we have some questions here. So just while we were just on the horticultural subject, um, you answered the, the color issue, but... Um, <laughs> How far north in the U.S. can lace caps be grown, Michael? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, generally, I think you have zone USDA hardiness zone five. Uh, if it's in a bit of a protected site, if you're growing some of these hydrangea uh, macrophyllas, uh, you know, if it's a little bit of a protected site, and sometimes, you know, they might die back down to the ground, um, but uh, you can uh, deadwood them in, you know, late spring. Or, sorry, late winter, early spring, and, and generally they'll still be flowering for you in, in midsummer. But yeah, zone five, you're, you're, if you're in zone four, you're, you're going to be practicing some zone denial. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, 
Are you aware of any um, of these plants in the glass flower collection? That is a fantastic question. I don't believe I've seen any of these, but you know, I, 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 uh, I don't have an inventory of that at present, but that would be uh, for what, what uh, Pam is speaking is the Ware Glass Flower Collection, part of the Harvard Museum of uh, Natural History. Uh, and um, that would be, wow. Rachel, I think we need to find, we need to, we need to contact Jennifer and, and find out, yeah, we'll add another curator. I know, we're gonna have three now <laughs> in these. I think it's a great thing. I was talking with someone about that yesterday. Um, uh, what would a private 17th or 18th century garden have looked like? These, these I assume, are in very high-level gardens. Is that correct? Formal gardens of palaces or temples? Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, I think the, the, the historical material that, that survives that could help us answer that question is going to be about uh, very high-level residences um, around the sort of courtier uh, the court of Gomizanor, uh, who was emperor in the early 17th century in particular. Um, th there may well be people on this call who have more information than I do about, about this specific subject, because I'm not a, a garden expert, uh, as you know. But um, I think that the, the idea of them being painted as kind of virtual gardens does give us an idea of what people wanted to see, at least. I mean, you would never see it all at once, but the idea that there's a path through them, and maybe maybe you wouldn't have walked that path physically. Maybe you would have sat inside your residence and looked at that garden rather than actually walking through it, which is sort of what we think about today is you know, the kind of, for me, the English concept of, of walking in a, in a landscape, whereas actually maybe looking at a landscape and walking through it in your mind may have been closer to what was intended at the time. From, from the diary of uh, the celebrity gardener that I referred to, early 17th century diary, it seems as though it was uh, a little bit um, the practice that I see here in that um, people might uh, in completely replant a garden seasonally so that you might have a garden of just one plant, a sort of a garden. So um, poppies, for example, which don't flower necessarily for terribly long. There, there are records of people having a poppy garden and going to a party for appreciating the poppies, which of course would, would then have been over. So then what would you do? Maybe you put up your screens at that point. Uh, I'm not sure. But, but I think the idea of contemplation and looking was probably just as important as any sort of sense of walking through a landscape at that point. And these screens were used in, I would assume, in wealthy residences. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, they're kind of um, temporary walls. You can divide a space with them. You can um, imbue a space with a certain mood, uh, a particular reception for particular guests, that kind of thing. That, that was all possible. They're very movable. So. Um, I know in our last presentation that we did jointly, you talked about the paints, but could you talk a bit about um, the medium that's used and whether these have faded, how they've stood up to the years? Sure. Um, so a lot of the paints that I use here with this is a combination of um, organic dyes and mineral pigments. And the, the, the organic dyes are subject to a little bit of fading with light exposure and the mineral pigments are subject to abrasion. So uh, particularly say the white pigments, um, they have quite large particles they are often made from shell white. So these are quite large ground particles and with rubbing over the years, um, the, they, they can be abraded away. And in some cases, uh, I think probably in this image of the hydrangeas here, you can see there has been some loss of that kind of pigment, which is very, very typical. Um, they're on a ground of paper, which is unusual um, in that it is basically un, untreated, pretty much untreated. Often these screens were on a gold foil ground, which makes them incredibly sort of luminous uh, and also quite artificial in a way. So they, they, they were not only walls, they served as interior illumination too. Uh, you know, daylight would hit this gold and it becomes this luminous area. These screens are really, um, they're much more subdued and they're very intimate for that. Um, the, the background is this sort of uh, grayish paper color and I don't, there's nothing lost there. This is how they were intended to be. And they're also unusual because they include um, in the summer screen, there are a couple of butterflies. And then in the autumn screen, we actually have a couple of moths. Uh, so, so they're quite unusual I'm among a group of, of screens that are known. There's very well known pair in New York at the Asia Society. It's a wonderful pair at Tokyo National Museum and another great pair at the Nezu Museum. And this, this, this uh, pair of screens sort of fits into the early part of the history of the development of those screens. 
can you share, are you willing to share the name of the celebrity gardener? People oh, uh, <laughs> his name is, uh, I, I haven't got it on a slide. It's Nishino, Nishino Toin Tokiyoshi. Okay. You're welcome to email me if you'd like me to send you, send you written down. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I can type it in the chat if I can find okay. it. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, um, Pam, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we have gone over time. So I think we have maybe time for one last question. Okay, I think this is uh, most important. How long will this exhibit be up and is there any hope of anybody seeing it live? There certainly is, yes. So we are dark right now um, and we're not quite sure yet exactly when the museums are gonna be reopening. We're waiting for guidance from, from Harvard Central, but we will be reopening with this exhibition. That much we do know. So when we reopen, we'll really look forward to welcoming you to see the paintings in person. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Molly, for driving the program. And um, we do not have another of these planned, but there are thoughts swarming around in our heads. And we hope to bring you another one of these wonderful collaborations. So thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you very soon. Bye-bye.